Our lecture this afternoon, which will be a short lecture through intent, will discuss the eternal role of the disciple in the disciplines of the law. I do not think that we are dealing now with an extraordinary problem. In other words, the subject of discipline. Disciplines, of course, are the formation of correct habits. It is necessary for us, if we are, to be a disciple of the great masters, that we follow their disciplines, and we have no record at all in any history of any master or any great teacher or any person of wisdom that has not given proscriptions, directions. In other words, uh, as a physician, they would be giving prescriptions for life. I do not consider the disciplines of the law a burden. I consider them a blessing. I can give you one example that lives not far from our own backyard, and that is one of our students whose name is Natalie Peck Phillips. Natalie is over 80, I think over 85 years of age, somewhere, probably close to 90. And several years ago when she had a mishap right on our own doorstep in Colorado Springs, she was taken to the hospital with a broken hip. When she fell over, it didn't seem to us as though anything had happened at all. She just fell a few feet, and the next thing you know, her hip was fractured. So they took her to the hospital, and they put a pin in it. And she had surgery, very quickly. And the poor woman lay there, and she was in mental agony. So she said to me afterward, she said, you know what saved me? I said, well, I know something saved you real quick because I said, you seem to get a hold of yourself. And many older people, I said, when they break a bone, that's it. A lot of times they take them to the hospital and in no time at all, you read their obituary. I said, so what saved you? She said, my discipline in the decrees. Well, I said, how did that save you, Natalie? And she said, well, it saved me because I had the decrees memorized. And she said, even when I lay there rather helpless and feeling terribly, terribly discouraged for a moment, she said, I soon, instead of giving way to these feelings, I started the use of the decrees. And then I began to realize, as I was analyzing the values of disciplines, I began to realize that it took her a while to learn those decrees. In other words, she had to practice with them quite a while. And I began to realize that there were many sayings that I was taught as a child by my mother that I found to be of great use all through life. Even our uh, early lessons in school, at least in the primers that I studied, they had a certain moral value in them. And there were poems and there were little sayings and stories that stuck with me. And so I like to think in terms of these stories, these moral maxims, these ideas that uh, seem to endure with the pyramids. I like to think that these have value, not only to me, but to you. They have value to everyone. And I think that it is a great mistake to expect that the great masters are not going to give disciplines to mankind. And so we expect discipline. Last night I was talking with uh, Dr. Carey, our neighbor, quite late in the morning, probably around 2.30 or so, 
we were discussing, and he was quite familiar with the Franciscan Fathers, and of course he was knowledgeable about St. Francis, and he said something to me that I had not realized about St. Francis. He said that St. Francis had died at about the age of 32 or 33. Now he probably told me that the exact age he died, but it was very early, a very young man. And I said, what did he die of? And he says, well, he said he died of an ulcer of the stomach. That's a funny thing, I said. I didn't think ulcers killed people like that. And he said, well, they usually don't, but he said he didn't take care of himself. And then he said to me, he said, you know, he said, Paul the Apostle told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities. I said, yes, I'm familiar with the passage, Dr. Carey. I was quite interested in, in the man's uh, knowledge of the scriptures, his knowledge of uh, the teachings of religion, uh, the fact that uh, he also told me that he was a great believer in spiritual healing, and yet he's a surgeon. So I came to realize in talking to him, when I started to consider the life of St. Francis, that St. Francis had not really had a very long life at all, considering all the things that he accomplished while he was alive. And yet St. Francis uh, although he failed to take care of himself physically, he had many rigid spiritual disciplines which he imposed upon himself. So this is an interesting thing. The uh, universe did not turn itself upside down and inside out in order to save him physically. And his influences and his writings, the influence of his writings has endured. So discipline is a quality within the universe itself. And I think that it is absolutely wrong for us to expect that the universe is going to turn upside down and, and do tantrums to try to uh, save us from uh, experiencing calamities, personal failures and tragedies, if we don't do something to try to help ourselves. Now I believe that one should not sacrifice uh, their spirituality just in order to preserve their physical body because sooner or later, if that's the way we feel, I think we're going to lose out anyway. Because you just can't... What preserves the body is the soul. Uh, what preserves the body and makes it life worth living is the, the soul and the soul's consciousness, its ability to understand God. And so what are the disciplines of the law really all about anyway? The disciplines of the law are about revealing the universe, about revealing God to us, making him tangible so that uh, he has size and dimension at least to our consciousness. Well, you say, how can infinity have any size and dimension? Well, that's just it. You have to create some image for infinity. And I believe mathematically, even pi has been created as an image of <laughs> infinity. Uh, Phil Compton, is this correct in your opinion? Well, they can only approximate it by an infinite number of numbers. An infinite number of numbers, they can approximate it. Well, that's all we can do. Phil is quite a, a mathematician, very capable man. So I wanted to ask him because uh, we have our scientific limitations. Sometimes we're able, all of us, to reach out and appreciate various aspects of science, but we do not fully realize what science really is doing ourselves. Now, yesterday, someone here gave me an old Reader's Digest from the year 1966. It has an article in it that says, momentous scientific advances may soon give us godlike powers to tamper with the essential nature of man. But have we the wisdom to use them? It looks as though they were touching on many things. Will man direct his own evolution? The newspaper right now is telling us that we are soon going to be able to produce test tube babies. We can have a baby uh, and buy the baby at the local counter if we want to and raise the child. 
Uh, they'll wrap it up in pink ribbon or blue ribbon, give us a choice of male or female, measure the size of the brain, and we can decide just how this child should look. We can even have a child that looks like ourselves if we want to. But there are uh, uh, many ramifications to this, and I'm sure that some of you intellectual geniuses will be able to come up with some of those problems before uh, perhaps the rest of the world does. But be that as it may, this is a violation of the disciplines of the law. Uh, we need, of course, to be able to recognize our creative powers. But for us to create physical bodies, well, I think I ought to go back to this script again here uh, from the Reader's Digest to just point out a couple of things that I could hardly believe at first. It says, would you like a larger, more efficient brain, a cure for old age, parentless babies, body, size, and skin color to order? As a consequence of current research, discovery, and achievement in a number of scientific fields, no idea about future transformations in the lives of men seems too wild to contemplate. In sober scientific circles today, there is hardly a subject more commonly discussed than man's control of his own heredity and evolution. And the discussions seldom leave much doubt that man will acquire this control. It is a matter of when, not if. All of which means that brain cracking, complexities, legal, social, ethical, moral, philosophical, religious, are soon to be thrust upon us. The discoveries in the field of reproduction alone have already created scenes that formerly would have seemed like science fiction. Not long ago, Dr. E. S. E. Hafez, an experimental biologist at Washington State, commissioned a scientist, friend from Germany, to bring him a hundred head of prize sheep. The entire herd is to be delivered to Dr. Hafez in one female rabbit. A hundred incipient rams and ewes, all of them embryos, only a few days old, growing as if still in their natural mother. Following a procedure already well established in Europe, Dr. Hafez will implant each embryo in a ewe, where it will gestate and in a few months be born. Hafez sees no reason why this method will not work as well with people. He speculates that only 10 or 15 years hence it could be possible for a housewife to walk into a new kind of commissary, look down a row of packets not unlike a flower seed package, and pick her baby by label. <laughs> Each packet would contain a frozen one-day-old embryo, and the label would tell the shopper what color of hair and eyes to expect, as well as the probable sex, size, and IQ of the child. After making her selection, the woman could take the packet to her doctor and have the embryo implanted in herself where it would grow for nine months like any baby of her own. Other research suggests that she might even have alternatives to carrying the child herself. Some scientists have already grown embryos in vitreo, though their embryos lived only a few days each. If none of the technical obstacles turn out to be insurmountable, someone is going to bring forth an entirely grown in glass baby. I want to also point out that the new idea of cloning, uh, it isn't exactly new, but the idea of cloning has now uh, been arrived at where uh, we will clone our presidents and send out the image, you know, and let them assassinate the image if they want to, and uh, the real president will stay in his little glass cage back in the White House or somewhere else. It reminds me of some of the concepts that uh, you're really the safest if you never get up in the morning, you just stay in bed. Because uh, if you get up, you might die. You might do something. I heard recently of a lady, who, in fact, this lady told me that her daughter went to school one morning. And uh, they called her up and uh, something had happened during that morning where the child had just fallen over and bumped her head and she was dead right there in the classroom. Well, I realize the first thing that people can say is, uh, well, I shouldn't have sent her to school. And of course, that's probably the way most of us would feel. We always feel right away, it's just too bad that we did whatever we did, because if we would not have done that, the dire calamities of life would never have happened to us. I don't think that's true at all. I think that uh, there are hazards inherent within life and we just have to be prepared to face them and I'd rather be happy about it than I would to uh, constantly live in a world of fear. Because uh, it's really quite remarkable the number of people that attain the age of 70 
and the age of 80 and the age of 90, and some even get to be well over 100. And of course, if you go over to some of the uh, countries in the Middle East, you will find that uh, there are nations there where uh, it's quite normal for people to marry at 100. Yes, they get married at 100. Now, I know that's kind of shocking, but I mean, it happens to be true. So, the thing that I want to point out to you is that none of you should ever expect that you're going to get any place unless you follow the disciplines of the law. I think that laxity is the big problem. While we're going through this university of life, we've got to be careful that we do not become lax with ourselves. That we don't just decide, well, uh, this discipline or that discipline is unimportant. It is not unimportant. I don't say that if you have an exercise program in the morning and you don't get up and do it, or you have a meditation program in the morning and you don't get up and do it, that that's going to uh, necessarily interfere with your whole spiritual life. And you're suddenly going to find out that you're out of the fold, you're no longer a member of the fold simply because of uh, what you fail to do. I think that's a mistake to condemn ourselves. Everybody once in a while misses something, and I think probably you should. I think that uh, you'll be stronger if you recognize the right to do something or not to do it. The only thing is, don't do it too often. That's what I find. I mean, don't make a habit of it. Because if you make a habit of it and you become soft, well, then you, you're not going to be able to go anyplace. I was just talking to one of the gentlemen here who was telling me how they get up every morning and they have a decree period together, he and his wife. And they decree for the light to come down and the, uh, the tube of light around themselves. Now, this tube of light must be invoked. I know a lot of people try to live in the awareness of the light uh, somehow or other, they recognize that there is such a thing as a tube of light. They recognize that there is such a thing as a momentum. But they actually do not go about the business of developing it. Now, I got faced with this one time, this very situation, where a man was brought to me who was a soldier from Vietnam. And he had killed in Vietnam. And he uh, had on his conscience... Uh, the murders that he had committed. And he was aware of it. And so it had begun to bother him a great deal. He did not sleep well at night, and uh, he couldn't find any meaning in life, and he was really very, very, very sad. So they brought him to me, and he talked to me, and he said, I can hear what you're saying. But I wasn't reaching him very well. So I finally decided I was going to call on my tube of light and bring the energy down until he could feel it. And so I called, and he sat there, looked at me, almost insolently, as if to say, so what? So I, I'm afraid I overdid myself the next time. I intensified the call. I hoped that it would be about twice as strong as before, and I guess it was about three times as strong. Yes, he felt the second one. He felt it all right, but so did his mother. She was sitting across the room 20 feet from us, and she was paralyzed. She couldn't move a muscle. So his mother sat there weeping. I mean, really, seriously weeping. Any of you staff members that were present when this happened? You know about it. Well, that's good. <laughs> yes, it happened. Believe me, it happened. But anyway, uh, I was grateful for the fact that I had a momentum that I could call upon. And I want to tell you something. If you don't use the disciplines of the law, you're making a big mistake. Because uh, you build this momentum up every day. You build it up more and more and more until after a while it becomes a real part of you. And in moments of need, it stands up for you. It will help you. It's like the case of uh, Natalie Phillips. I mean, the fact that she had a momentum and knew the decrees was the greatest help to her in the world. 
Now, as long as you can hold a decree book in your hand, you don't really have to worry too much. Like if, if you've got a decree book there and you're laying in bed and you're, you have an accident or you have a, a problem of any kind, I don't care if it's a small cold, and you're, you're in bed and you're cooped up and you can't get out and you want to do some decrees. If you don't remember the decrees and you don't have a book, what do you do? Make them up? Well, yeah, you can make them up. That might be fun. That might be fun making them up. But somehow or other, you see, you can't make up your momentum. This is what you don't have. You don't have the momentum. So by doing them every day, you not only memorize them, but you also develop a momentum. So it's an extremely important thing. It's something we can't do for anybody. They have to do it for themselves. Some people say to me, well, I don't see you decreeing a lot. Now, I probably personally do not decree as much as some of the other people, and I want to explain the only reason why this is so. My administrative duties and the duties of writing require more of my attention than most of the other people. So when I take a dictation from the Master, and I take one almost every week, sometimes twice a week, when I take a dictation, I get a charge from the master that is probably more than you get in 20 days of decreeing. And this is a little advantage. And thank heaven there's a few advantages to the job. <laughs> so that's the only reason why it happens. It's very difficult for me sometimes to find the time and still do my duties. This was not true in the early days of the activity. As many of our early staff members will tell you, I used to be down early in the morning going through the disciplines with the people. In fact, I led many times. Today, sometimes our bedtime is 12.30, 1.30, you name it. And uh, it just isn't uh, enough time to sleep. So uh, I realize we're violating the law when we do this, the laws of life, the laws of God, the laws of nature, the laws of health. But you show me how to solve it, and I'll, I'll really be delighted. I mean, I've figured, and I've figured, and I've figured. So I gave up figuring, and I just try to fit myself into whatever figure I find <laughs> that I can fit myself into. So uh, I want to stress then in this lecture that if there are disciples tomorrow and I'm talking about in the year 2000 if there are disciples in the year 2000 or 2500 or 3000 and I guess it's hard for most of us to think in those terms because while we know it lies ahead it's a little harder to look ahead than it is to look back at 4,000 B.C. or something like that, because we have the history all recorded in the books and on the tablets. But yet, in the years that are coming, as I see it, the same things that we face today will be faced by the man of the future. Oh, there will be other twists and problems. You know, I mean, uh, new scientific advances are going to bring about new laws and new approaches to old laws. We're going to have to look at some things differently. I guess grandmother would really gyrate in her grave if she saw some of the things that are happening today. It just is almost unbelievable. But just between us girls, boys, and so forth, I want to tell you that there were many hidden things that went on in the older times that didn't always make the front pages of the papers that probably never got out of the closets of individuals. People were not always all that good, and they're all that bad. They were pretty much like a lot of people are today. But the disciplines have never changed. In every single time of the past, there have been people preparing for spiritual mastership. We have more people today that know more about spiritual mastery from the intellectual and contemplative standpoint than we've ever had probably upon earth since the days of Atlantis or Lemuria in the Golden Age period, the Apex periods. We really have a lot of people who know about it, but we still don't have enough people that are actually uh, practicing it. I think probably one of the reasons for this is because of the self-righteous factor. 
A lot of people imagine that the whole thing is a matter of being good goody. You know what I mean? In other words, they want us to be so good that we deserve God. Well, we were that already when God created us. But it was a gift. Now, I want you to understand there is a difference between a gift and something that you merit. You deserve God in his opinion when he created you, when he created the matrices of life. We deserve the goodness that God intended to impart to us. We didn't get it. Well, why didn't we get it? We got it in our soul, but we did not transfer it from the soul to the disciplines of the law in our life, but we transferred it in part. We gave little parts of it, some attention. You know what I mean. People carried a lunch bucket to work back in the years 1880, just like people do today. Somebody uh, drove the streetcars, somebody harvested the grain, somebody made the shoes. But that is not something that necessarily uh, merits some special quality that makes you deserving of all of the gifts of heaven. In other words, when Jesus said, do you think that those men were sinners upon whom the tower of Siloam fell above all the other people who dwell in Jerusalem? He says, I tell you nay, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. This clearly shows something then to us, doesn't it? Just by carrying your lunch bucket or doing your daily duty doesn't assure you that you're immediately going to be carried to heaven because everybody else probably does their daily duty or in years gone by they did. We didn't have any system whereby people could just apply to the welfare department and live free of charge. Now we have that, you see. So, I mean, it isn't necessarily what you do from a standpoint of your occupation that counts, but it's by your realization and your realization of the disciplines of the law and your being a disciple of the great masters. Quite frankly, when you talk about the laying on of hands, the transfer of authority where one man is standing here and another man puts his hand on his head. If you could get this picture of the laying on of hands of the spiritual masters upon their disciples, you would understand that this doesn't just mean touching them. It means touching their lives enough to see that their lives are like the masters. So the whole principle is one of the imitation of God, the imitation of Christ, the imitation of the masters, in other words, following the disciplines of the law, and don't let anyone kid you. There's too many people today who are trying to do just that because they first fool themselves and they try to fool you, and everybody else they can fool. It isn't necessary. We have to understand that the disciplines of the law are the law, that the law is love and the law is God, and the becoming of that is our real test. In other words, not just to talk about it. You know, they say everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. What we have to do then is do something about the opportunities and instruction that have been given to us. These are the disciplines of the law. So I don't think, with all the instruction we've given in this class, it's necessary for me to carry this forth in larger measure. 